All right, so we now pick up the story about Egypt and the Bible relations between Egypt and the kingdom in Jerusalem. And last period we talked about how uh, Pharaoh Shishak or Shoshank I took the gold of the temple and from King, what had been King Solomon's gold, all the wealth, and brought it to Egypt. Uh, by the way, those of you familiar with the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, the assumption of that movie is that the Ark of the Covenant was taken by Shishak and brought back to Tanis for Indiana Jones to discover. So you realize that this, this uh, movie is based on this uh, passage. But anyway, whatever happened to King Solomon's gold that we're told that Shishak brought back to Egypt? You're looking here at Shishak or Shoshank's son, Osorkon I. On the left, a, a, a depiction of him uh, from a temple in Tel Basta, Zazig. On the right is a statue found in Byblos in what is today in Lebanon. And uh, what's, what's interesting is that he became king in the year 924 BC. It was just one year earlier that his father invaded Israel and Judah and the area around Jerusalem. After the great victory, Shishak came back to Egypt and died almost immediately. So one year later, with his son Osorkon I on the throne, we have records, the text of which is here, of massive donations of gold and silver that Osorkon made to the temples of Egypt. And you can see this inscription from Talbasta and Zazig uh, records that gold and silver were given to the temples of Egypt totaling 348 tons of gold and silver over a period of four years between 924 and 920 BC. So chances are that most of the gold taken from the temple in Jerusalem, the gold that David and Solomon had amassed, were brought back to Egypt by Shoshank and given by his son Osorkon to the various temples in Egypt. So that is the, probably the, the best evidence we have of that uh, claim that the gold was taken from Jerusalem. One of the good kings of Judah was King Asa, who reigned from 910 to 870. And during his reign, he experienced an invasion. We only know about it from 2 Chronicles. And we're told that this invasion was by a man named Zerah, who is called a Cushite, a Nubian. This is in 2 Kings 14.9. And of course, the question is, who is Zerah the Cushite? Uh, his name cannot be identified with any of the Nubian kings. And by the way, we're, we're way ahead of the Nubian uh, dynasty by almost 200 years. So it cannot be uh, the Cushite, later Cushite king. So who is Zerah the Cushite? Some have tried to identify him with Osorkon I, who would have been the King that we've just been talking about. But uh, linguistically, the, the Egyptian name Osorkon uh, cannot be equated linguistically with the Hebrew word Zirach. It just doesn't work linguistically. So most, even though some had suggested that in the past, it doesn't work. One interesting thing is that 2 Chronicles 16.8 says that this army that attacked Judah was made up of Cushites, that is Nubians, and Libyans. And of course, the 22nd dynasty is a Libyan dynasty. So no surprise that the army is largely a Libyan army with some Cushite troops, Cushite or Nubian. Now, the suggestion that makes sense, uh, okay, Osarkan was Libyan, yeah. By this time, Osorkon I was an old man uh, by the time of Asa's, this invasion. And so the, the suggestion is made 
that Zerah was actually a general who was a, himself a Cushite. Now, again, you think, why? How would you have a general who is not an Egyptian or a Libyan? Why have a Cushite? There's a long history of Nubians uh, being an Egyptian army. In fact, just recently, and now in the Cairo Museum, is a block that was found with an inscription on it from a tomb of a general in the New Kingdom from the time of Ramses II. He's a general and he has a Semitic name. So he's not even an Egyptian, but he's a general under Ramses II. And the depiction actually shows Nubian soldiers marching out of this fort. So it's in the Cairo Museum, you can go see it. It was only put there in the last couple months. So we can see that uh, at different times in history, Nubian soldiers were used in the Egyptian army. So the idea that he was a, a general, a Kushite, a Nubian, uh, is a very good possibility. So notice that Chronicles does not call him the king of Egypt, does not call him Pharaoh, simply identifies him as a Kushite military leader. So uh, in this case, uh, what was the reason for this invasion? We don't know, but uh, we're told that Asa was faithful to God and the invasion was defeated. Now, I'd like to move down to the period of King Hezekiah, when we have a very important connection between Egypt and Hezekiah. He is elevated as one of the greatest kings since the time of David. On the right side is a small piece of pottery with a painting of a king of Judah. Uh, sorry, with the, you can see the beard here, the arm, and the, the nice uh, robe he's wearing. This was found at a palace near Bethlehem, a place called Ramat Rachel, and it's believed that this was a palace where the kings from Jerusalem would go for the weekend. It was a short distance from Jerusalem to get away from the city, and the pottery dates to about the time of Hezekiah. So some people think this could actually be a depiction of Hezekiah. It doesn't say so, but at least we get the idea he had a nice beard like me, okay? Or like the Abuna. Okay. Now, this wonderful king, we are told, he trusted the Lord, the God of Israel, so that none was like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held the fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. Uh, and he did all this, and yet um, he experienced an invasion. I already showed you this. So I'm not going to take the time now to uh, go into that again. He experienced an invasion in the year 701 BC. We read in 2 Chronicles 32, Sennacherib the king of Assyria came and invaded Judah and encamped against the fortified cities thinking to win them for himself. When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and intended to fight against Jerusalem, he planned with his officers and his mighty men to stop the water of the springs that were outside the city, and they helped him. A great many people were gathered, and they stopped up all the springs and the brook and the, that flowed through the land, saying, Why should the king of Assyria come and find much water? So they set to work resolutely and built up all the wall that was broken down and raised up towers upon it. Outside it, he built another wall. So here we see that with the Assyrians coming, Hezekiah set to work to prepare his city for an invasion. And one of the things that he did was to divert the water from the spring. Now, what he's referring to, and he also refers to building up walls, but uh, what you're looking at here is the old entrance to so-called Hezekiah's Tunnel. They've changed the entrance uh, in recent years, but it used to be you would go into this archway and you would come into this uh, tunnel and you would see the spring, the water gushing out of the rock. This was the main water source for Jerusalem. It's called the Spring of Gihon. 
and uh, it's a, a beautiful, cold, clear water. And normally this water would flow out towards the edge of the city and down into the valley into the, book, to the brook of Kidron or the Kidron Valley. So if the water was going this way, the Assyrians could sit outside of the city and have all the water they wanted. So what Hezekiah did was block this water and make a tunnel and it went back into the city and came out the backside of the city. So the tunnel is something you can actually walk through today if you go to Jerusalem. It's, there are no lights. You have to bring a flashlight or your, your phone with the light on and you can wind around and go through this long tunnel. Halfway through the tunnel there was an inscription which talked about the making of this tunnel and how the men worked. They came from opposite directions and almost passed each other by. And then they had to cut across to meet each other. It's a wonderful thing. The original text of this is in Istanbul during the Ottoman Empire and got taken from Jerusalem to Istanbul. When you come out, the pool of water is, is known as the Pool of Siloam. Uh, the Pool of Siloam that we know from the New Testament. Uh, however, we now know that this Pool of Siloam, this particular pool, was not the pool in Jesus' day. This was the pool from the Byzantine period. And since then, under the wall here, uh, pipes have been found which led the water down that, that Hezekiah had made and it leads to another pool that is the pool of Siloam of Jesus' day. But the point is Hezekiah made this to bring water into the city and the wall that he built to add to the defense uh, uh, has also been found. And so this is a reconstruction of what Jerusalem would have looked like back in those days. Uh, the original spring with the pool was in here and the water came out either the gate or through a trough and down into the valley. He directed the water to go back and come out the backside of the city, which was quite an engineering feat. Now, the Assyrians tell us a lot about this invasion. In fact, we have a number of documents written in Assyrian, in cuneiform script. And here is what Sennacherib, the Assyrian emperor says, as to Hezekiah the Jew, he did not submit to my yoke. I laid siege to 46 of his strong cities and walled forts and to the countless small villages in their vicinity. What just happened there? Here we go. And used battering rams uh, to break down the walls and attack by foot soldiers and on and on it goes. Then, uh, moving down, he collected 200,150 people, young and old, male and female, mules, donkeys, camels, cattle, uh, all this he took as prisoner and booty. He himself, that is Hezekiah, I made a prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal residence, like a bird in the cage. I surrounded him with earthwork, in order to molest those who were leaving his gates and to plunder his towns. The nearby city of Lachish, one of the important cities that defended Jerusalem, we read about in the book of Kings and in the book of Isaiah, was attacked by Sennacherib, and Sennacherib left depictions of this attack on Lachish. What's interesting, and we know this in the Bible, that Jerusalem was miraculously saved. Jerusalem did not was not defeated by Sennacherib. When Sennacherib returned to Nineveh to celebrate his victories, he made a memorial of his defeat of the city of Lachish, not Jerusalem, because he didn't take Jerusalem. Uh, so we have these wonderful pictures. You see people leaving the city as prisoners, uh, women and children. Here you see uh, Judean men bowing down to the king and surrendering. Here is Sennacherib sitting on his throne to receive their submission. And some of the families went into exile in, in, with ox and carts and uh, families, children, etc., taken to Assyria as prisoners. 
Now, we also are told by Sennacherib, the kings of Egypt and the bowmen and the chariot corps and the cavalry of the kings of Ethiopia assembled a countless force and came uh, to their aid, that is the people of Ekron, one of the cities near Jerusalem, in the plain of El Tika, which is uh, just uh, north of Gaza, in the plain of El Tika, they drew up their forces against me and sharpened their weapons. The Egyptian charioteers and princes, together with the charioteers of the Cushites, the Nubians, I personally took alive in the midst of the battle. So here we have word that an Egyptian force came out to fight against the Assyrians. The Cushites, this is the term we use in the Bible for the people in what is today Sudan or the southern part of Egypt. Uh, we, again, I think we're most familiar with the word Nubians. But the Cushites, the people of Cush, are mentioned in Isaiah chapter 19. Uh, sorry, Isaiah chapter 18. Isaiah chapter 19, of course, is the great prophecy about Egypt. Isaiah 18 is a great prophecy about the people of Cush. So, it begins by saying the land of buzzing wings is as good as dead. The one beyond the rivers of Cush that sends messengers by sea to glide over the water's surface in boats made of papyrus. Go, you swift messengers, to a nation of tall, smooth-skinned people to a people that are feared far and wide, to a nation strong and victorious, whose land rivers divide. Isaiah 18 talks about the Cushites coming and for the first time becoming a political factor in the history of the Old Testament. So Isaiah 18, the coming of the Cushites up the River Nile. Now I mentioned already the stela of Pianchi in the Cairo Museum. About 727 BC, he came north to Egypt and established what we call the 25th dynasty. From 727 to 664, Egypt was controlled by these Cushite or Nubian kings. Now, back to Hezekiah and the hardships of 701 BC. In 2 Kings, chapter 19, verse 9, we read, When the king heard, that is the Assyrian king, Sennacherib, heard concerning Tirhaka, king of Ethiopia, behold, he is set out to fight against you. He sent, he, the king of Assyria, sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah. So this is the message to Hezekiah from the Assyrian king. Do not let your God on whom you rely deceive you by promising you that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of Assyria. So the king of Assyria hears of the coming of this army force from Egypt led by Teharka, the king of Ethiopia. Now the Assyrian general comes to Jerusalem to tell Hezekiah the following. He's called the Rabshakeh, so he's the chief military officer. Say to Hezekiah, thus says the great king of Assyria, on what are you relying this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war in whom you are now trusting? That you, they ha Why have you rebelled against me? Behold, you are trusting now in Egypt that broken reed of a staff which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it, such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust him. Just like Isaiah had said earlier, Egypt is not a powerful nation anymore. You can't trust Egypt. Now, nevertheless, notice that 2 Kings 19 and paralleled by Isaiah chapter 19, mentions the name of the leader of the Cushite Egyptian force, and his name is Tirhaka. Tirhaka. Who is Tirhaka? 
We know him in Egyptian texts as Taharka, not Tirhaka, Taharka. And here you see his, him bowing down and making an offering to Horus. Uh, he is the son of Pianki, the man whose steel is in the Cairo Museum. And uh, Taharka will be one of the Nubian or Kushite pharaohs. These Kushites actually thought themselves to be Egyptians. They continued to build pyramids long after pyramids were not being made in Egypt. They were culturally Egyptian, although they spoke their Nubian language. They wrote in hieroglyphs and thought of themselves as Pharaoh. And right behind here, behind this restored pyramid, there's a larger pyramid. That is the pyramid of Taharqa. We see him using the same kind of Egyptian funerary devices, the usheptis, like Egyptian kings would. And, but you can see his very clear African features uh, on his face. So he reigned from 690 to 664. Um, okay. So, as I said, he became king in 690 BC, so what was he doing in 701 BC, fighting against Assyria and coming to the aid of Jerusalem? Another interesting question is, why did he come to fight? Was he a friend of Hezekiah? Was, was his father a friend of Hezekiah? We don't know. I think the Cushites were smart enough to know that the last kingdom that had a chance to stop the invasion of the Assyrians was Judah. And as soon as Judah was uh, taken by the Assyrians, the next invasion would be Egypt. So it made sense, better to fight the Assyrians in Judah than to fight them in Memphis. Better to stop them from invading. And I think that's what they were doing. They were acting out of their own interest. Now, as it turns out, in 701 BC, Taharqa was not the king. His older brother, Shabataka, was king. Shabataka was king, and I think his brother sent him as the leader of this mission. There is another inscription in the Cairo Museum of King Taharqa, and on it, right here, I've enlarged it over here, he tells us that when he was 20 years old, there's 1020, he was summoned by his brother, the king, in Memphis, to go north. We're not told why. But there are reasons to blink, think that his brother was calling on him to lead this military campaign into Judah. He would have been 20 years old, and then 10 years later, when his brother died, he became the king. But at this point, he was simply the crown prince or the next in line. But there you have it, this 20-year-old leading the armies of the Cushites. So I'm going to move on because of time, but here is, is a Taharqa. Um, again, you see the Cushites writing in hieroglyphs. There's this cartouche. Um, we also have a, um, a large stela, a very large stela in Berlin. This was actually found in Turkey many, many years ago. And this is King Esarhaddon. Esarhaddon was the first Assyrian king to successfully invade Egypt. And when he invaded Egypt, he claims to have taken Taharqa as prisoner. And here is Taharqa kneeling down. Um, and again, you can see his very African features. So, in the end, it was the, the King Ashurbanipal, the last king of, the last great king of Assyria who invaded Egypt. In the year 664, he conquered all the way down to Luxor and down into Sudan. And uh, here you see him in battle, and it actually mentions in the prophet Nahum, chapter 3 and verse 8, where it describes how the city of Thebes had been destroyed, and also Nineveh, 
the capital of the Assyrians would be destroyed in the same way as the city of Thebes. So, um, now, when the Assyrians took control of Egypt, the Assyrian Empire was very, very large, controlling all the way from Sudan through what is today Iran and most of Turkey. Huge empire. And, of course, the king could not stay in Egypt. So he appointed a governor, and that governor was from the Delta, and his name is Necho. And in a sense, he became the founder of the new dynasty. Shortly after the Assyrians left, Necho I, in essence, became the pharaoh. He was appointed to be the governor, but he knew Assyria probably would not come back, and he became the king. And his son and successor is the famous Samtek, or Semiticus I, who reigned for almost 50 years, or 50, 54 years. Um, you may have read in the news in the last couple years to discover this very large statue in a canal. Um, and it's now sitting on the grounds of the Cairo Museum. But here he is, Semiticus, or Samtek I. So he is the father of the next king of the 26th dynasty, and that is Necho II. Necho II, uh, we know, uh, is the Necho who came to Jerusalem, or actually came to Judah, and killed King Josiah, good King Josiah. You can read about this in 2 Kings 23. In his days, that is Josiah, Pharaoh Necho of Egypt went up to the king of Assyria at the Euphrates River. King Josiah went out to meet him, but when Pharaoh Necho met him at Megiddo, there's Megiddo again, he killed him. His servants carried him dead in his chariot from Megiddo. They brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own tomb. The people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in the place of his father. So in 609 BC, the king of Judah is killed by Necho II. So the grandson of Necho I, who was put in power by the Assyrians after they invaded Egypt in 664. Uh, now, that was not all that Necho II did. This is concerning Jehoahaz, who replaced Josiah for just three months. Necho came back, and Pharaoh Necho confined him, took him prisoner, um, that he might not reign in Jerusalem, and he imposed tribute or taxes on the land, and Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, son of Josiah, king in his place, of his father Josiah and changed his name to Jehoiakim. But he took Jehoahaz away. He came to Egypt and died there. Jehoiakim gave silver and gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land in order to meet Pharaoh's demands for money. He exacted silver and gold from the people of the land from all according to their assessment, what they were taxed, to give it to Pharaoh Necho. So Pharaoh Necho was not a very good guy. He killed King Josiah. He removed the next king, Jehoahaz, took him to Egypt where he died. He placed Jehoiakim on the throne and taxed Israel very heavily. So it's interesting, sometimes Egypt can be a friend, like Taharqa, and sometimes Egypt can be an enemy, like this or like Shishak. Jeremiah also reports, Jeremiah chapter 46, concerning Egypt, about the army of ne Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which was by the river Euphrates at Carchemish. Now, just to, for a moment here, the year is 605 BC. The big powers of the world are changing. The Assyrian Empire and the city of Nineveh have fallen. A new power is emerging, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And it seems that Necho, by going up all the way to the Euphrates River, 
is trying to say, listen, the Assyrians are gone, the Babylonians are coming, maybe I can make Egypt control all of the land of Israel and Judah and Syria, just like the good old days. And so he's up there pretending to be this great Thutmosis or Ramses Pharaoh, and Nebuchadnezzar comes and smacks him around, and that's the end of him. So he goes running back to Egypt in the fourth year of King Josiah. That's the year 605. So uh, Necho, his name appears several times then in the pages of the Old Testament. And uh, he seems to desire to make Egypt a great empire once again, but fails because of, first of all, Assyria's power, and then, of course, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, builds e uh, Babylon to be a very powerful kingdom. Okay. It seems that every time Jerusalem or Samaria is in trouble, Egypt either is called upon for help or Egypt acts in its own self-interest, as I think Taharqa represents. He came because he understood if the Assyrians were not defeated, the Assyrians would invade Egypt, and he was right. Now, we move forward to Nebuchadnezzar and his attacks on Jerusalem. Once again, the army of Pharaoh had come out of Egypt, and when the Chaldeans, or the Babylonians, who were besieging Jerusalem heard the news about them, they withdrew from Jerusalem. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. Thus says the Lord, God of Israel, thus shall you say to the king of Judah, who sent you to me to inquire of me. Behold, Pharaoh's army that came to help you is about to return to its own land. So the Egyptian armies came out to try to fight the Babylonians, and God says to Jeremiah, but this is not going to help them. They will be turned back. Jeremiah 44, thus says the Lord, I am going to give Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt, into the hands of his enemies, those who seek his life, just as I gave King Zedekiah of Judah into the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, his enemy who sought his life. Now, Hophra is a little-known king, but in Rome, behind the Pantheon, there is an obelisk, a small obelisk, uh, of Pharaoh Hophra, and it's on the base of it is an elephant carved by the Italian sculptor Bernini. So how you get Bernini elephant with a Hofra telescope, uh, obelisk is fantastic, but he's the king who couldn't help Jerusalem against Nebuchadnezzar. And here's a picture of him, a statue of him as well. In the Cairo Museum, you'll see these uh, nice dark, um, I think granite type pillars from the palace he built in Memphis. And you see his name, Ha'a Ibre. Ha'a Ibre comes out in Hebrew as Hofra. Um, so we have some archaeological remains of this king who did not, in the end, help very much. So Ha'a Ibre, Hofra. Um, let's move on. Now, Jerusalem falls in 586. Hofra is unable to help. What I'd like to do is end with the presentation of the perspective of Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah saw all this happening, and Jeremiah himself will end up in Egypt. So, uh, Jeremiah tells us about what happens in Jerusalem. When the Babylonians take away thousands of people as prisoners from Jerusalem, they assign a man named Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, was appointed governor over the remnant of Judah. Those who were left behind were governed by Ahikam, uh, Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam. A seal with the name of Gedaliah was actually found near Jerusalem, and so he was now the man in charge, and we, we actually have documentation of his presence. Seven months later, after Jerusalem has fallen to the Babylonians, after most of the population has been taken away, we're told that Gedaliah, the governor, was assassinated by a man named Ishmael, son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishama, of the royal family. 
Somebody connected to the royal family of Jerusalem does not like that a governor is a non-royal person. And so they kill this man seven months later. Unfortunately, everybody understands when you kill the governor of the Babylonian emperor, the Babylonians are going to come back and deal with the rebellion. And indeed they did. This is what led a group from Judah to decide to flee to Egypt. 2 Kings uh, 25 says, Then all the peoples, both small and great, and the captains of the forces, the leftover military officers, went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. They rightly understood that when you killed the governor, appointed by the Assyrian, by the Babylonians, that there would be justice to pay. Now, Jeremiah comes into the picture at this point because Jeremiah was about to be taken to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, but instead he was left in the care of Gedaliah, the governor. Jeremiah 40, verse 1, talks about this. And so he lived with the Judean refugees, if you will, in the city of Mizpah, just north of Jerusalem. Now, at this point, this group that flees to Egypt takes Jeremiah along with them. And we read in Jeremiah chapter 43, and they came to the land of Egypt, for they did not obey the voice of the Lord. God says, stay in, stay in, in Judah, I will be with you, I'll protect you. But no, they said, we're going, we're getting out of Nebuchadnezzar's way. So they came to Egypt and did not obey the voice of the Lord, and they arrived at Tahpanis, and Tahpanis is, a, is a, an Egyptian name for Tahut Panechsi. Tahut Panechsi, which survives into Greek as Daphne, and today in Arabic as Daphina, Tel Daphina. Then we read on. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah Tachpanis. I'll show you a map in a moment. You'll see where it is. Take in your hand large stones and hide them in the mortar in the pavement that is at the entrance of the Pharaoh's palace in Tachpanis in the sight of the men of Judah and say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will send and take Nebuchadnezzar, the king of of Babylon, my servant, and he will, I will set his throne above these stones that I have hidden, and he will spread his royal canopy over them. What God is saying is, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and invade Egypt. You fled Jerusalem thinking you're getting away from him, but Nebuchadnezzar will come to Egypt. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar invaded Egypt twice, most severely in 568 B.C. And for this, we do have some archaeological evidence and some destruction of that invasion. While Jeremiah is in, in the northern part of Egypt, Tel Daphne, he receives a message from the Lord, Jeremiah 44. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah concerning all the Judeans who lived in the land of Egypt, who lived at Migdal, at Tachpanis, at Memphis, and in all the land of Pathros. Well, Migdal, Tachpanis, and Memphis, we all know. I can show you on the map. Pathros actually is, get this, the ancient Egyptian name for the Said. The south land, the southern part of Egypt, is Pathros. So the point is, when Jeremiah arrives in Egypt, there were Judeans living from the very north in Migdal to the very south in Aswan. Egypt was completely, uh, uh, there were Jews living in Egypt from one end of Egypt to the other. Jeremiah 43 also talks about the coming of Nebuchadnezzar. Behold, I will send and take Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant. I will set his throne above the stones that I have hidden and I will, he will spread his royal canopy over them. He will break the obelisks of Heliopolis. Remember, the obelisk is a symbol of the sun god of Heliopolis. 
and the temples of the gods of Egypt, and the temples of the gods of Egypt he shall burn with fire. So interesting, Nebuchadnezzar would not respect the temples of Egypt, would burn them just as he burnt the temple in Jerusalem. He didn't respect anybody's temples. Now here's a map showing you the line of sites mentioned in Jeremiah, and archaeologically we can actually track them. Migdal, we talked about the location of that yesterday. That was the fort that um, was discovered in recent times from the pre-Persian period. Here's another site from the same period, uh, another site, and here's Tachpanes or Tel Daphne. So Migdal, Daphne, and then Memphis is down here. Here's Tanis. So you can actually see this line that Jeremiah would have traveled coming to Egypt, very interestingly. Now, one more interesting thing about Jeremiah's uh, reference to the frontier of Egypt is in Jeremiah chapter 2. He refers to the men of Memphis and Tachpanis, again, have shaved the crown of your head. What does that mean? It probably means they have insulted you, they have done you harm, and this seems to be a reference to the damage Egypt had done in killing King Josiah a few years earlier. Have you not brought this on yourself by forsaking the Lord your God who led you in the way? And now what are you going to gain by going to Egypt to drink the waters of Shehor? Now many of our English translations say the Nile, but the text is very clear. It says Shehor, the waters of Horus. Or what would you gain by going to Assyria to drink the waters of the Euphrates? Now, yesterday, I introduced you to this area on the edge of Egypt and this ancient lagoon or lake that was here. And this is the fort that we believe is the fortress Migdal, which is also mentioned by Ezekiel. So this was the border town of Egypt in Jeremiah's day. So when Jeremiah arrived in Egypt, this is where the refugees coming from Jerusalem would have had to present their passports or get visas, entry permits to Egypt, pay your $25, and in you go. And this is a, this is a drawing, a plan of this a very large fort, 200 by 200 meters on the side. And uh, the archaeologist Oren, who worked there, identified pottery uh, from this period, including pottery uh, associated with Judea. So it was clearly there were some people of Judah living there who brought some pottery and things with them. Now, at Tel Dafina, some work has been going there in recent years by our Egyptian colleagues and our French colleagues. And uh, you can just see here are some buildings. These are from satellite images. A large temple, large temple, a large surrounding wall, and it may be that in this blue area is the palace. Uh, when the archaeologist Petrie worked there way back over 100 years ago, he thought this was uh, a palace. Uh, if he's right, then that would be the palace that would have been there in Jeremiah's day. But more excavation is needed to confirm that. But certainly this is uh, Tachpanis. And so this would have been an important city where the Egyptian armies would have gathered before they would have come into Judah in Josiah's day, in Necho's day, and uh, we'd like to learn more about it. So we've, we've looked at that. Um, sorry. All right, so here is where that fort I just showed you is located, the fortress of Migdal, and here are the waters of Shehor the Lake of Horus. And so in Jeremiah's day, when you arrived in Egypt, the first two things you would see is the fortress Migdal and the waters of this lake, which by this time, the water was not very good for drinking. Um, the Nile was now not flowing through here. The Nile was way up here. So the water was not good to drink. So why would you go to Egypt to drink this horrible water? In Jerusalem, you had this nice water from the spring. Why would you go drink? It didn't make any sense. So 
That's what we're getting at. So now we, we want to wrap up. Jeremiah and Egypt. Um, after his message that he delivered at Tachpanis or Daphne, somewhere around 585 or 584, the Bible is silent as to where Jeremiah went in Egypt and what he did. Did he travel and, and visit Jews all the way down to Aswan and warn them the word of God? We don't know. We also know that his faithful friend and the man who actually physically wrote the book of Jeremiah, named Baruch, Baruch the son of Neriah, went with him to Egypt. If you look at Jeremiah 36, when God tells Jeremiah to write down the words that God had given him, we're told that he spoke and Baruch the son of Neriah copied down his words. So Baruch went with him to Egypt. So, based on the information of Jeremiah 36, we learned that Baruch was the one who physically recorded the book for him. Now, the fact that Baruch joins him in going to Egypt, it could well be that the book of Jeremiah as we know it was actually completed here in Egypt. Because Baruch was here, Jeremiah was here, and lots of papyrus was here. And we do know that by this time, um, Jeremiah would, would have been a man in his 70s. He would have been an old man, but not too old. And by this date, 568 BC, the king of Judah, who had been held in prison for all these years, Jehoiachin, who had been held in Babylon, was released. The last message in the book of Jeremiah is about the release of this king from prison in 568 BC. So uh, the book ends with this positive note that the king of Judah has been released from prison and this seems to signal that the exile for the Jews in Babylon was almost over. So I would like to think that the book of Jeremiah uh, was completed here in Egypt and that uh, Jeremiah the prophet, we don't know what happened to him. Did he go back to Jerusalem at some point? Did he end up living the rest of his life in Egypt? Uh, we don't know, the Bible is silent. But we began uh, yesterday by talking about the important role that Egypt played in the birth of uh, Bible history with Moses and the Exodus and Abraham coming to Egypt, and we leave with one of the great prophets, uh, Jeremiah, of course, spending his final years in the land of Egypt. So any way you look at it, uh, Egypt has played a very important role in the formation of, of the Old Testament Bible itself, the formation of Israel as a nation, and Old Testament history in general. So one of my, my goals in life is to help inform people, especially Americans, who don't know much about the importance of Egypt to biblical history, and hopefully I've been able to help you a little bit in that regards uh, these two days. Mm -hmm.